I could not think of a better introduction for a life of thanksgiving than Emmanuel, God with us. And you know what that means? We will never, ever be alone. Will you praise the Lord for that this morning? Will you give God glory and praise for that fact that we will never be alone? And that's really good news. You know why? Because the fire will come. How many of you just say, it feels like the fire will never go away either? <laughs> you ever feel like you're just in the heat of the battle and you're in the heat of that, that fire on a regular basis? And I, I love how the video pointed that fact out, that sometimes God calls us to stay in that fire. Peter talks about this in the New Testament. He says, my brethren, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Don't, don't be shocked, don't be surprised that just because you're a child of God, everything in life doesn't just rock along and go smoothly and, and perfectly. God allows trials to come into our life for a reason. But Peter also says, but don't let that make you afraid. Don't, don't be fearful of that because when you are tried, you will come forth as gold. You know what's beautiful about our passage this morning, especially how it ends? We didn't read all the way down through verse 6 in chapter 3. But in verse 2 in chapter 3, we're going to find out that God is like a refiner's fire. And God allows us as his children to go through periods in our life where we go through intense pressure, where we go through intense heat, where we go through trying and testing and uh, temptations in our life. So that way he can make us pure and holy just like him. And so I, I want you to get the idea of that man when he was standing in the midst of that flame. There was kind of that triangle that was around him. And to understand that, that, that that's the idea of the Christian life and where we're going. And that sometimes we need to learn to just embrace the heat. And the title of my message this morning is simply that. It's, it's not embrace the heat, but it's, it's bring the heat. Bring the heat. Now, I want you to understand something this morning that you probably are well aware of. Life will be absolutely miserable if you live in Florida and you hate the heat. So this morning, I just want to ask, where are all my miserable people at? Where are you? Come on. Yeah, I knew you would raise your hands up loud and high. Who, who does not like the heat and can't stand it? Yeah, exactly. Okay, there's hands coming up all over the place. I got to tell you, I was not prepared for Florida. I grew up in western New York and um, grew up there my whole life. And my family moved right before um, my freshman year of college. And so they moved in that summer. So I came down here and I started working in July in Florida. So I leave New York and you think you know heat and you think you know humidity, but you don't know anything like it till you come and start living in Florida. And I get down here and one of the things that I was most excited about was going to the beach, man. I heard about the Gulf Coast. I heard about the white sand, the clear water. I mean, I grew up going to some of the best beaches on earth in, in New Jersey, the Jersey Shore. How many of you have been there? How many of you say that's the far cry from the best beaches on earth right there? All right, we grew up going to the beach. I love the beach. I could not wait to get there. And I'll never forget. I mean, this is a vivid memory of mine. I will never forget the very first time I ever stepped foot on the beach in Florida in July. I hated every second of it. I remember getting out. The sun was hot. The white sand was hot. I was like, I'm just going to stay in the water the whole time. I got in the water. It was hot. It wasn't any relief. It was like bath water. I'm like dying even in the water. And I'm like trying to hide under a towel. I think we stayed 30 minutes and then we left and I didn't go to the beach again for a really long time. That's, that's how it was. And then as we start going through the fall, I'm like, where's fall? Is fall ever coming? Where's the leaves changing? Everything's just evergreen down here. It's just always that. I'm like, where's the fall? And then I'm like, how in the world does anybody ever get in the Christmas spirit in Florida? Like, I kid you not, I felt really bad as a college student, as an 18-year-old. I felt really bad for everybody that grew up in Florida because I'm like, they have no idea what Christmas is really, truly all about. I mean, I lived in western New York. It was, we lived in the snow belt. We'd get about 100 inches of snow a year. I used to deliver papers, like as a junior high or a teenage boy. I mean, old school. You put the sack around your shoulder, and you go take a paper to everybody's house, and you collect money once a week from them, and they'd give you tips. Well, I remember this one night. It's near Christmas time. It's dusk. It's like 5 o'clock at night, and I'm telling you what, the streets were quiet. The, the, the street lamps were just coming on. It's like a Hallmark picture in my mind. It might not have been that beautiful, but all of a sudden, there's these big, white, giant snowflakes that are coming down. The roads are covered in white. We're going back to our house that's all decorated for Christmas, and I'm like, 
that's the Christmas spirit right there, man. That's what it's all about. And in Florida, I'm like, where's the cold? Where's the snow? It's just hot and humid all the time. Well, somewhere along the line, things shifted. I don't know where. It wasn't like a magical moment. But somewhere in the long, along the line, I woke up one day and I realized, I now hate the cold. I don't want to be cold at all. Like, you know when your feet get cold and you just can't get in? I don't want that feeling. I like my warm. I like my humidity. I'll tell you what. You know what will put me in the Christmas spirit right now? A humid, damp, dreary night when you go outside and everything just feels dirty and nasty and a WFBA basketball game. And I'm like, ah, Christmas is here. That is Florida. I mean, that's what it's all about right there. My whole point here is, you can have the cold, bring the heat. You got, if you're going to live in Florida, at some point, you got you to gotta shift. You're either going to be miserable or you just got to start embracing it for what it is. And here's the point. Life will be miserable if you are a child of God and you hate the heat. Life will be miserable if you resist the work that God's trying to do in your heart and in your life, if you resist that refiner's fire where he's coming and he's trying to purify you and change you and make you life like him, if you're going to embrace a life of thanksgiving, a life that pleases God, you've got to embrace a life of intense pressure. You've got to say, okay, bring the heat. And I'm not trying to say that in a disrespectful, cavalier way at all, but just the shift in our mindset of it's okay. You're trying to do something in my heart, and you're trying to do something in my life. So let's just jump right into the passage. We've got a lot to cover in a short amount of time. But I, I want you to understand this morning, the first thing that we need to do is we need to say to God, bring the heat of expectation. Bring the heat of expectation. You know, we're going to look at three examples right off the bat before we get to our conclusion. Three different examples of human relationships. How many of you agree that, that human relationships have a way of pressing buttons in your life. <laughs> oh man, I, I, I was thinking about this this morning. I, I really truly believe probably the most intense pressure that we experience and that we face in life comes from the, the, the feelings and the relationships that we have that are going well or not going well with one another. And, and it's, it's not a mystery as to why, because Jesus himself says in the New Testament, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So if, if the distinguishing trait about us that's going to draw the world to a holy, wonderful, loving God is the way that we interact with one another and the way that we show a picture of what he intended for human beings to have with one another, then it only makes sense that Satan's going to do everything he can to attack that and to throw all kinds of things in our way. And so we have to understand, bring the heat of expectation. And we're talking about human relationships here. The first thing I want you to see is that God expects brotherly love. God expects brotherly love. Look at verse 10 of chapter 2. He says this, Have we not all one father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? You know what he's saying here? Aren't we one family? Weren't we created by God and brought into existence by God? And he's talking specifically about the nation of Israel. Aren't we the covenant community of Abraham? Aren't you the chosen people of God? Why then are you dealing treacherously or unfaithfully with one another? You are one family. You are one body. You have a purpose of showing the world who God is through the way that you interact with one another. Their unfaithfulness to God. We've been going through Malachi. Their unfaithfulness to God in their worship. It led to unfaithfulness with one another, which led to a complete breakdown in their society. Chapter 3, verse 5. We're not going to read that. Uh, you can go there and look at it later. I'm just going to sum it up for you. They, they, it was a, God's chosen people were a mess. There was rampant sexual immorality. There was false witnessing. There was lying and deceit and slander that was going on. Employees were being robbed. They either weren't being paid or they uh, weren't being paid on time. Widows and or orphans were exploited or neglected. Can you imagine exploiting and neglecting the most vulnerable people among you? And then foreigners, okay, the strangers, the foreigners in the land. They weren't even being treated like human beings. Among God's people, no one could be trusted. Can I tell you this morning that God expects brotherly love. If you read through the book of Leviticus, how many of you have read through the book of Leviticus? 
if you ever get bogged down reading through the book of Leviticus, that is one of those books you will get into a lot of things that just sound crazy. But what you'll understand as you go through Leviticus is that so much of the law that is mentioned there that is laid out has to do with how the children of Israel were supposed to treat one another and how they're supposed to love one another and how they're supposed to be equitable and fair and selfless in their relationships with one another. You understand that the New Testament, the entire Bible, it goes on, it gives clear instructions for husbands and wives and how we're to interact. It gives clear instructions for parents and children. It's not just children obeying your parents. It's you fathers provoking not your children to wrath. There's clear instructions for all of that, for employers and employees, the government and its citizens, and Christians and one another. God expects brotherly love. Jesus summed it all up, and he said, the entire law hinges on two commandments. Love God, love others. You'll see that everywhere around here. It's on our sign when you come in. It's in the hallway when you go out. We remind ourselves of that on a regular basis because the entire law, how we glorify God, has everything to do with how we love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then how we love one another as ourselves. All right, I want you to look at your neighbor, okay, someone that's near you, and I want you to say this word to them, okay? Give them this greeting this morning. Say, shalom. Okay, tell somebody else around you on the other side of you this time. Find somebody else, say shalom. All right, how many of you know what that word shalom means? It means peace, okay? But it has a very deep and rich and full meaning. That that meaning of peace there, it carries the idea of prosperity, wholeness, safety, completeness. Okay, shalom is a very common word in Israel today. If you walk up to somebody, they may say shalom. As you depart, they may say shalom. And what they're saying is, is may the God of prosperity bring peace. May he bring wholeness. May he bring safety. May he bring completeness on you. Do you understand that, that God told Abraham that he would experience this type of peace. Part of his covenant love is that God wants us to experience wholeness, completeness, security, and safety in him. Man, that's God is the prince of peace. We're going to celebrate that during the Christmas season. And when he came and when he was announced to um, the shepherds that were out in the field, it says, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, what's the very first thing he said? Peace. Goodwill towards men. God wants us to experience peace. You know how we experience that completeness, that wholeness, that security in our lives? It starts with our vertical relationship with God. Because the children of Israel failed to have the proper vertical relationship with God, everything in their life spiraled out of control, and they weren't complete, and they weren't whole, and they didn't have any safety. But when when you're right with God, when that bitterness is gone and it clears up and it becomes free. When you're able to forgive, when you're able to see things clearly the way that God wants you to see them and you have that right relationship with God, then you look at your brothers and your sisters and you say shalom. What you desire and want for them is peace and security and completeness and wholeness that only comes from God. You know, in the New Testament, it's, it's, it's interesting because he's talking about because their relationships were off, They were profaning the name of the Lord. And you get to the New Testament, and you know what he says in Ephesians? He says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. He tells us to grieve not. It's it's the same idea of profaning the name of the Lord, the blaspheme that comes when we don't interact with each other the way that we're supposed to. And he says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. And the context there isn't us individually. The context is the body of Christ corporately. Chapter 4 starts with, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bonds of peace. For there is one spirit and one Lord and one God and one faith. That's what he's talking about there. There's The reason that we're supposed to be committed to each other is because there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Father of all all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And we're to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. And then he gets to the end of that chapter and he says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. And how do we grieve it? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of thy mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying 
that it may minister grace to the hearers. Let all bitterness and wrath and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one toward another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. We profane the name of the Lord when we don't want the peace and prosperity of God to be on one another. And when we get blinded and we become bitter and we become filled with wrath and we gossip and we don't build each other up, we're out of line. And he's reminding them of that. The world will see Christ through the way that we love one another and the way that we're committed to one another. And what's important is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And it was the same thing he's saying to them, man, you all are so far out of whack because you've forgotten what it's all about. And so God expects brotherly love. But then he goes on and he builds on this. He's going to talk about a different type of relationship. He, you've got this whole idea re rebuilt back up of why it's important for us to love one another the way that God wants us to. Then he says he expects unwavering love. Look at verse 11. Look what he says. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem, for Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord which he loved. And everybody help me out on that last line. What's it say? And hath married the daughter of a strange God. Oh, I've been burdened this week. There's some, there's some tough things that God's calling out here. And, and I want to say this with a heart of compassion not to make anybody in here that's made a mistake feel bad about this because God is merciful. By the way, if you've confessed your sin before God, he forgives, okay? He removes your sin as far as the east is from the west. Never lose sight of the mercy of God. But this is a warning to everybody who still is not married yet. Okay, so you got the idea of the big covenant community. God wants that covenant community to stay pure. And so he tells us specifically that you should not be marrying people that are not of the same faith as you are. And this is one of Israel's besetting sins. If you go through the Old Testament, you will find it over and over and over again. This was a huge problem. You might think, well, what's the big deal? Well, he says that you married the daughter of a strange God, which means they were marrying people who bore the character of their father, the, their God, somebody that's lost, somebody that's, that's not God himself. So marrying the daughter of a strange God means they're marrying people who bore the character of a God and a worldview diametrically opposed to their God and their worldview. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? The only way that that human intimacy will work is if there's compromise and you aren't wholly committed to your God and your faith and you sell out on that, that, that area. That's why this is a big deal. So you know what we need to do? We need to bring the heat of unwavering love. What's the very first commandment in the Bible? Thou shalt have no other gods before you. Thou shalt have no other gods before you. This is where it starts. And you know what he's saying? Even the God of human intimacy. We have a lot of single people here this morning. I know we have a lot of teenagers in here. We have a lot of kids in here. We have a lot of single adults in here. And I think that's wonderful. I love the fact that we have young people in our church. And God understands your desire for human intimacy. He created us that way. Okay? He, marriage is a good gift. It's a wonderful gift that God gives. But here's the reality. You profane the holiness of God when you choose to unite yourself to an unbeliever in the most intimate, personal relationship on earth. God says, you should have no other gods before me. I need to be first and foremost in your life. You can't marry somebody that is diametrically opposed to God and has a worldview that is diametrically opposed to God. It's never going to work. You can't love me with all of your heart and do that. Look what he says in verse 12. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this. The master and the scholar out of the tabernacles of Jacob and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And that's some pretty harsh words there. And the idea is if you compromise in that area, you're going to give up your chance at personal intimacy with God. It's a tragic mistake to compromise the precious intimacy of a right relationship with God for human intimacy that even at its best pales in comparison, even if you have an incredible marriage and God blesses you with 50 years of love and all the blessings that come with a committed relationship, it still pairs, pales in comparison to the perfect relationship and the human intimacy that you can have with God. And it's a tragic mistake to sell out 
For human intimacy, the bigger picture of trusting God and staying faithful to him and relying on his precious promises as you go through that period of singleness. And by the way, God will. I know it. That's a refining fire. Especially those of you that, that stay in that single period longer, you, you want that human intimacy. And it feels like a relentless pressure, but I'm telling you, God is shaping you and making you more like him as you go through that. And look at how he ends this in verse 13. You can't fool God. It says, and this ye have done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore, or receiveth it with goodwill at your hand. You know what these people were doing? They were going through their life, and they were acting like everything was fine. They, they deliberately did something wrong. They married somebody outside of their faith, but yet they were still going to church. And they were still saying, I love God. And they were even at the altar offering their sacrifices with weeping. God, will you please just bless my life? And God says, I can't bless your life. I can't pour out my blessings on your life right now. You're not in a right relationship with me. Until you confess your sin, if you've made that mistake, listen, confess your sin and get it right with God, and he will forgive because he's merciful. But if you're just going through your life acting like you've done nothing wrong, God can't bless that. Even through your tears of asking and begging him to bless you, if we want God's blessings, we've got to do life the way that God says to do life. So bring the heat of unwavering love. God wants, God wants us wholly committed to him. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So God expects brotherly love. He expects unwavering love. And he expects loyal love. Look at verse 14. He says here, yet you say, wherefore, again, how have we profaned your name? He's just indicting them here. You're not getting along with one another. You're marrying people outside of the faith. And then it says, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. You know what he's talking about here? Marriage. And he's talking about the pathetic view that they had of marriage. Marriage is a covenant commitment. Just last night, I was looking on our desk, and we have a picture of our wedding, and it was in this room, and it looked a whole lot different than it does now. I mean, it was back years ago when it was green and the stage was in one of its original stages it looked a whole lot different in here but I'm looking at our where we got married and I'm just bringing back all those memories and when I stood at that wedding altar and uh Alana and I got married I made a commitment I made a promise before all the witnesses that were there and it was a covenant commitment and I made a promise to Alana that I will love her honor and keep her in sickness as in health in poverty as in wealth, and forsaking all others, keep thee only under her as long as we both shall live. And, and Pastor Stewart said, uh, my dad actually is the one that said it, do you so promise? And I said, I do. And then you know what? She did the same thing. Her dad looked at her and did, read her vows and asked her the same questions. Will you love him and honor and keep him in sickness as in health, in poverty as in wealth? And you know what she did when we got to that poverty as in wealth? When she got to poverty, she actually couldn't say it, and she choked up and started crying, and then she was like, in poverty as in wealth. And I was like, she just knew what was coming, you know, right there. <laughs> but she did it anyway. <laughs> and we made a promise. You know, the seriousness of a wedding, it gets me every time. I, I get more nervous about weddings than I do about anything else that I do. And it's, I think it's just because of the seriousness of the moment. There's normally cameras that are there that are capturing the moment. It's not about you at all. It's about the couple. More importantly, it's about God and the covenant of marriage. And you know what? Just recently, I completely botched a wedding. I've done dozens and dozens of weddings, and I'm, I'm up there, and this wedding was nice. I mean, I'm telling you, they spared no expense whatsoever. I got three cameras in my face. Things are rolling along, and all of a sudden, my iPad just blanks out on me. The, my, my message just disappears. Now I'm panicking, and I'm like, I've done this dozens of times. I know the content, so I try to keep going, but now I'm getting more nervous. My face is turning red, and I'm like just stumbling all over myself, and then finally I'm like, when I get to the vows, I don't have those memorized. So I just stopped right in the middle of this wedding, cameras everywhere, and I just said, my iPad messed up. Does anybody have a hot spot? That's what I said. Needed to bring my notes back up. And then I looked at Atlanta. I was like, this isn't going to work. And I looked at Atlanta, and I said, just give me my phone. I had to stop in the middle of the wedding, walk all the way down the aisle over here to where she was sitting to get my phone, to pull up my notes again, to put it back down, to look at everybody and say, now let's go on. 
You know what's crazy about that wedding, too, is a little while later, um, we got through that part. We just rolled on, and then we got to the vows, and all of a sudden, I hear this big thud to my left, and I'm like, oh, no, a prop just fell over. It was the bride's brother-in-law passed out. I'm like, this wedding is just, this is going next level now. I mean, this is, I just looked at them. I kind of turned off my microphone. I was like, don't worry. This is not a sign that this is going to be a disaster, okay? God's still in this. It was funny. We just all laughed, and it ended up being actually a very funny moment and a very funny thing. But I'll tell you what, sometimes you feel the pressure of the people that are watching you, and you feel the pressure of the cameras, and it's like, man, they're going to watch this every single year. But you know what's interesting about what we just read? Look back at the beginning of verse 14 there, and uh, look what it says. Yet ye say, wherefore? And then what's it say next? Because the Lord hath been witness. You know who's the unseen witness at every wedding? God is. Marriage is a covenant relationship. Marriage is a relationship that God designed, that God created. He brought Eve to Adam in the garden. And he has a reason and a purpose for it. And the reason is to show the world who he is. It's a picture of Christ and the love that he has for his church. And it is a covenant relationship. And when you stand there at the altar and you make those vows and you make those commitments to each other, God sees it, God confirms it, God records it in heaven. And best of all, he blesses it. Marriage is a good gift and a perfect gift from God. And he blesses it for the foundation of your family, but not just for that but honestly, for the foundation of all of society. Look how he builds on this. Look at verse 15. He says, and did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the spirit, and wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. You know what God's doing in this verse? He is commending those who use their marriage to seek a godly seed. The reason he brought us together And the reason there's that covenant love there, that loyal love, is because when both parents remain faithful to God, and then when both parents remain faithful to each other, you know what their home becomes? Their home becomes a school where the ways of God are taught and practiced. And that's, the, that's one of the purposes of marriage is in our homes, we raise up another generation. We raise up another community who are taught and who are shown an example of God's loyal love to us. And yeah, our homes are imperfect. And yeah, we're a big mess. And yeah, they don't, our children don't always go the way that, that, that they're raised and that they're trained to go. But that does not change the fact that our desire as parents in our homes and in our marriages is to please God and to use our homes as a school for his honor and for his glory. Next week, we're going to have a baby dedication. I think we have 11 babies right now. And we're not really dedicating, we're really dedicating their parents to the Lord, that they'll commit their lives and their home and their marriage to God and to bring their children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so here's the whole point. Bring bring the heat of loyal love. Look at verse 16. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. You know what that verse just said right there? God hates putting away. God hates divorce. And he compares it to violence in the sense of this. When two people get married, two separate human beings become one flesh. And when you... When you separate that one flesh, that's the idea of where that violence is coming from. You are tearing apart what God put together. And more importantly than that, when you're tearing that apart, you're tearing apart the opportunity that you have to use your home, not just as a school for your children, but a school for the world around you. Because your home and your marriage is a reflection of God's loyal love. He loved us enough that he died on the cross. And us as husbands are supposed to represent Christ and his selfless, sacrificial love on the cross. And wives are supposed to affirm and to receive and to submit to that love. And when we are both selflessly, sacrificially loving one another, oh my word, that's a beautiful picture of Christ and the love that he has for us. And when other people look at your home and your marriage and they say, wow, I want what they have. It's not us that they see. It's Christ and it's his biblical principles that they see. And again, this isn't to make anybody feel bad. I know, I know we have people in here that are divorced And again, God forgives, and you're not a second-class Christian citizen. God can use you, and he can use your story. But this is for all of us who are married. 
who will be getting married, to remind ourselves of the big things that are at stake here. Bring the heat of expectation. God expects brotherly love. He expects uncommitted, I mean, um, unwavering love. He expects loyal love. How many of you agree with me that in all of these areas that we talked about, that our buttons will be pushed <laughs> in all kinds of different ways? And the heat that comes from those things. But you know what God wants to do through all of those trials and all of the selflessness that we have to learn, man? He wants to make us more like him. And I want to conclude this morning with just this last point. Bring the heat of accountability. Bring the heat of accountability. I'm not going to read all the verses, but verse 17. At the end of the verse, God says, he asked this question, because basically the children of Israel are saying, where is the God of judgment? They're just living their lives like, Remember how the book started? They were just saying, where are you, God? Have you forsaken us? Have you forgot about us? And they got to the point where they're just, they're just justifying. They're just making up their rules. What's right is right for me. What's wrong is wrong for me. Like They're just coming up with it all on their own. They're just totally ignoring God. And they're living their life in a way where they're tempting God, saying, where is the God of judgment? And you get to chapter 3, verse 1, and he says, behold... I will send my messenger. Guess what? He's talking about Christmas time. How many of you are excited about Christmas? Christmas is coming. In the Bible, what Christmas is all about is literally coming. He says, I'm going to send my messenger. That's John the Baptist. And one day you are going to wake up. And Emmanuel, God with us, he's going to be walking around in that temple. And his presence is going to fill that temple. The creator of heaven and earth in flesh is going to be in the temple in front of your very eyes. Where is the God of judgment? Make no mistake about it. He's on his way and he's coming and it's going to happen quickly. And then look at verse 2, though. Everybody look at verse 2. What does it say? Everybody read that very first question with me out loud. It says this. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. What's one of the very first things that you teach your kids as a parent or you learned as a kid about fire? You don't play with fire because if you do, guess what? You're going to get what? Burned. And I like the fact that he said that God is like a refiner's fire. If you know anything about the refining process, okay, all of the precious metals, they come from the ground. And you start a mine, and you go into that mine, and you know what you do? You pull out ore. And when that ore is pulled out, it's filled with gold or silver or aluminum or all the precious metals that are in the earth. And you know what you do with that ore? You stick it in the fire, and it starts going through the refining process. And here's the reality. When the God of judgment comes, there's going to be one of two ways that we're going to be found. We're either going to be found like gold. We're either going to be precious metal because we put our faith and trust in him. Or we're going to be dross. We're going to get burned up. The Bible talks about that. He's going to separate the wheat from the tares. And he's going to throw the wheat, I mean the tares, into the fire. Like it's that same idea. You're either precious metal or you're dross. And here's the reality. Don't play with God. Yeah, you might feel like he's far away and you might feel like you can get away with your sin because he's long suffering and he's patient because he loves us and he cares about us. But one day, the God of judgment will come. Don't play with fire. But here's where I really want to go. Don't fear the fire. The fact that he is like a refiner's fire makes all the difference because you know what? He doesn't come as a forest fire. You know what a forest fire does? It burns indiscriminately. It just torches the path of everything that is that, that's in its way. That's not how he's coming. He's coming like a refiner's fire. Look what it says in verse 3. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord and offering in righteousness. Bring the heat of accountability. What do I have here with me? It's just small, but what is this? Yeah, do you all see your reflection in there? You all looking good? How are you looking, Kevin? You're looking pretty good this morning. I brought a mirror. You know, I was just doing some studying on these things. Like, just I was reading about the whole refining process, and it's pretty amazing, actually, how it all works. And I found out that, actually, you know how they originally started making mirrors was they would overlay a mirror with silver, after it went through that whole refining process, I can't do this because it's like 
Yeah, there, yeah, she's jumping right there. Sorry. I'll turn it this way. I noticed that flying around. People are ducking their eyes. Um, Levi still, sorry about that. <laughs> um, you go through that whole process. So they would used to overlay silver because in the silver, you could see your reflection. By the way, that's how the refiner knew that he was at the finished product when he could start seeing his face in it. You know what I found out that mirrors today are mostly made of aluminum. It's a little bit cheaper than silver, but you know what? Aluminum is the same way. Aluminum is a precious metal that's in the earth and you get it the same way you get gold and silver. You go, you get an aluminum mine, you dig it up and you take that ore and you put it into the fire and it goes through that refining process. And when it's all said and done and the master looks at his product, you know what he's able to see? He's able to see his reflection. You know what the world doesn't need? The world doesn't need to see me. The world doesn't need to see you. <laughs> we got plenty of examples of broken people. And by the way, that's all of us here. I, I didn't even clean this mirror up, man. This mirror's got scratches on it. It's got dirts on it. It's got smears in it. Kind of a picture a little bit of our lives. Yeah, I want to have right relationships with people. They can be messy. I want my home to be and our marriage to be a picture of God and his loyal love to us, but sometimes it's messy. I, I want my love for him to be unwavering. I don't like the heat. When I say that, like bring the heat, it's not in a frivolous way at all because I have to remind myself, I don't like when the fire gets turned up, man. I don't like standing in the middle of that. I like comfort. I like a perfect temperature. I like the way it was yesterday. It's about as good as you can possibly get. You know, that's why I want my life to be nice and sunny, perfectly cool, not too crazy and flying out of control, but that's not how God wants us to live our lives because the world doesn't need us living cool, comfortable, easygoing lives, just getting by because we're created for more than that. The world needs Jesus. And in our relationships with one another inside the church, in our homes, in our dating relationships. Yes, there's gonna be heat and there's gonna be fire because God wants to turn it up and he wants to get all that dross and all that impurity and everything that, that takes away from him and who he is. And he wants to clean it up so that in the end, when people look at us and they see us, they don't see me, they see Jesus. Because the only way I'm willing to forgive and the only way I'm willing to go forward with this is not because I'm powerful and good enough to do it. It's because he is powerful and good enough to do it in me and through me for his honor and for his glory. And the whole point of this, what, what Malachi, what God's telling his people, what he's telling us today is stay in the fire. Don't think you can jump out and get to a cooler place. By the way, everything outside that little circle is just getting consumed and burnt like crazy. There's nowhere to go. Stay in that fire. Know that he is with you. Know the work that he's trying to do in your heart and in your life and embrace it. And get on your knees and talk to God. Ask him for the strength and the help that you need so that you can, in the end, be a better picture of him. And our community, our body of believers can be a better picture of him. And our homes and our marriages can be a better picture of him. Stay in the fire. Do whatever you have to do to work through the things that you're going through so God gets the honor and the glory.